There has been a lot of debate online about the use of the Abrams tanks in Ukraine, whether Ukrainians are using them properly or not, especially after we have seen several of them being lost to enemy fire. So I decided to interview an actual Abrams tank commander in order for him to give his insight into the operation of these vehicles out there, since he definitely knows more about that than I could ever even after hours of research, especially since he has been serving on the Abrams tanks for quite some time. You will hear us referencing a document of the 47th Brigade that talks about Abrams' performance. It is a document that was leaked by some Ukrainian organization of women against war or something like that, and Russians started spreading it around on Telegram. And me and him talked about it during one of our discussions. Anyway, I will leave a link to it in the description for anyone who is interested to check it out, since we touch on it extremely briefly. And he didn't want to use his real name, just the nickname he uses online. Also, there will be a few cuts in the recording because of some minor connection issues. It's only a couple that occur for a split second, but just wanted to let you know so you know it is not on your end. Anyway, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, I am Step Eagle. Just call me Step. I'm a Staff Sergeant in the United States Army. I've been in for almost 10 years now and nothing but active duty force com meaning i've deployed several times four times technically rotation if you want to call it that uh i've been to the middle east i've been to korea and i've been to europe twice with armor brigades i've been on primarily the set v2 uh m1a2 set v2 and currently now on the set v3 I was, I played around on A1s for a little bit in some training units when I had to go to certain schools, but I've cut my teeth mostly on the set B2. Um, yeah, big lover of tanks, been tanking for a long time, and got a lot of experience. Okay. Do you believe that Abrams, specifically M1A1SA, is suited for the war in Ukraine? I mean... Like I was like I was saying before, tanks in general are going to get put wherever they're told to get put. You can design a vehicle to fight in your specific terrain or your specific theater of conflict, but it doesn't mean it's going to fight there. Like for instance, I don't think anyone at Ural or Gonzavat, which I, yes, I completely butchered that, never thought that the Indians would buy T-72s and put them in the Himalayas. I don't think General Dynamics land systems ever thought that designing a vehicle for the war in Europe to fight the Soviets in the least or as long as it did. So it's not a question of is it suited or is the Ukrainians actually like fighting with it correctly. It's just what does the modern scale of battlefield look like these days. So I think it's suited for just about anywhere because it doesn't have a choice. Okay. That's just my opinion. Okay. What do you believe is the biggest threat to the tank in Ukraine so, right now? So the biggest threat to not just the Abrams, but every tank in general is the proliferation of drones. You have to realize that this whole concept of the drone warfare that we're going on now is very, very new to all of us. Uh, for instance, my unit who's currently training in the field right now remarked that their last training about a month ago, DoD contractors were finally interjecting drones that would drop quote-unquote simulated hand grenades into the hatches of the vehicles just started happening. Um, supposedly they're going to interject more of that, but you have to, you really, really have to take into consideration that this whole drone concept is still absolutely crazy to a lot of people like my ancientness i remember getting a drone brief in 2016 when we were going to go to Mosul, iraq and go fight isis and we were blown away by the amount of these fpv drones dropping hand grenades and all this now it's even scarier so without proper electronic warfare which everyone is still trying to adapt i mean i'm sure people have seen all the russian examples and ukrainian examples of doing it in the West, it's a very, very hard concept to get around because we're used to thinking the concept of drones is something that's 
strategic level that's operated by the Air Force and dropping Predator missiles wherever it is. And now it's like you have squad levels being able to send up a drone with an RPG-29 warhead that can take out a main battle tank. So it's primarily drones and the extensions of the drones, like being able to correct artillery in real time. That's the major threat to everything else now. And regardless of how much protection we put up, whether it's the heavily memed, which is actually very useful, believe it or not, the quote-unquote cope cages or anti-drone cages, it it's the only real thing that you can use, as well as just actually taking camouflage into actual consideration, which is something a lot of units, especially for me, during my time in training, we never truly thought about until, oh god, uh, Lancet became a thing. So... It's uh, it's drones and what they can do. That's the biggest threat. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay, um, from the videos and pictures we have seen, both from the Ukrainian and the Russian side, do you believe that Ukrainians are using the tanks properly? That, to me, is an extremely loaded question that I brought up to a few of my officers when we would talk about this. And... It always goes back to, they'll say, well, doctrinally, they're not using it correctly. Doctrinally this, doctrinally that. that That's a big buzzword that I hear, including lethality and a bunch of other favorite buzzwords of United States Army officers. The thing is, what does that mean? What does doctrine mean in the U.S. and the Western sense? What it means is, is working together as a platoon or as a section. So to break that down, section means two vehicles, a platoon means four vehicles in the Western sense. And US armor doctrine is based on these vehicles working together to provide mutually supportive fire so that they can assault objectives, defend objectives, seize key terrain, and other things like that. That's in a nutshell. Anyone who wants to read into that, you can look up the tank platoon manual. Uh, the newest one is June 2016. It is. It is available to anyone. You can find it on the internet. So not preaching OPSEC or anything when I say this. Um, the Ukrainians are forced to utilize tanks, kind of like how the Germans were having to utilize it, in my opinion, in Normandy, where it was individual tanks taking part in individual action. Now, there is several examples of legitimate armored assaults. I mean, for instance, Volodar, uh, the pushes into Avdivka, and a few other combat um, instances of combat where you would have multiple armored vehicles working together. But it's actually very rare, I was saying before, with the drones. The ability for everyone and their mother to have a drone put up and get a real-time view of the battlefield and not relying on the nervous reports of other soldiers allows for people to concentrate fires very easily. So, the Ukrainians and the Russians, to, to much of an extent, are having to use individual tanks in order to prevent heavy losses. So, it's to conserve their forces as much as they can, but it's also the nature of the conflict. You're looking at positional warfare. You're fighting over key positions on key hills, key towns. You're not just throwing yourself against one battalion against another battalion in this massive beautiful world war ii style battle you're fighting for position after position so you also have to understand that those positions are heavily protected by a large amount of not only drones but also atgms so what's the point in having all of these massive losses when you can use individual tanks to provide the firepower that you need and then supplement that with drones from what I saw with the Ukrainians utilizing the Abrams and also the loadout from the document that me and you translated from 47th Mechanized Brigade, yeah, they're primarily utilizing their Abrams in an actual really smart way, and I've noticed this with a few other tanks in this conflict. So when the tanks would show up to a fight, like for instance, let's look at the last videos in Berdishi, when the Abrams tanks were firing from one village to another and then they would back up and quote-unquote run away well what they were doing is they were emptying 
probably about six or seven rounds per and then backing up to another position to fire at another to give the idea that there was more than one Abrams tank or more than, let's say, a platoon's worth of tanks were located within Berdishi. So it's to give kind of a a ruse effect to it where, oh god, there might be more vehicles here, we need to focus more here. Or it could just be a case of they're simply trying to just get the tanks in there to try and just try and scare the enemy. That's the best way that I can think about it. Um, but the utilization of them, I mean, the Ukrainians are using them just like every other tank, and they're trying to prevent them from being destroyed. And as we've seen in a large amount of reports coming from Ukraine and from the Russians, the Ukrainians are running out of vehicles. So to be very sparing with the amount of Abrams that they have, and remember, they only have 31 of them. And now they've, like, what, lost confirmed four, possible fifth. I also can kind of really guarantee that not all of the remaining ones are still in working condition. And they're having to keep them working with spare parts from other vehicles. We do that a lot in the U.S. Army. So they're using them as best as they can. And, I mean, in a war where there's such a heavy amount of eyes everywhere with everything carrying a warhead at this point they're using them to the best of their abilities okay do you think that this war or the tactics that ukrainians are using is going to influence nato in the future i think it will primarily because and it goes back to the drone aspect you have to seriously consider this is something that a lot of people do not think about. And I think I've told this to you a few times. The United States Army officially switched from counterinsurgency, COIN, to peer-on-peer -peer warfare. I can't remember the actual name for it, so I just keep saying peer-on-peer -peer, in 2016. The rest of NATO has been relying on American military power for the longest time now. And... Due to the fact that you are seeing a everyone's stocks are nearly empty at this point. You're seeing the rate of attrition go up. You're seeing the amount of shells being used in levels that we haven't seen since the Second World War. As well as going back once again, drones. That's the biggest thing that I can say about this. With drones being the apex predator at this point. Now, I know people are going to say, you know, drone teams and all this. At, at this point, I expect because we don't really have an efficient way to deal with them completely yet. I think it's going to change how NATO operates from this grand battle idea to worrying more about individual tanks and individual initiative and working in smaller elements to achieve a larger goal. Because when we train... And granted, I forgot to add this in my introduction, I'm a tank commander. And before that, I was a gunner. I was a gunner for four years. I was a tank commander for two years. I was loader and driver for about two, three years in between those two positions. So I've held every position. And I've felt every bit of pushback that comes from those positions, whether we're maneuvering in the deserts of Fort Irwin, or maneuvering in Korea, or maneuvering in in Germany, we as the United States Army, we like to operate in a macro sense, where we're operating as a company of 14, 14 tanks at all times. We're operating as battalions of around about probably 50-something armored fighting vehicles in general. And we are not used to operating just in our own as companies anymore because we all have to rely on each other. So I think there's going to be a push coming up for more individual or individual company-based proficiency in combat. Meaning, okay, tank companies are going to be able to be like, all right, instead of dispatching out two vehicles at a time to go get destroyed, we'll send out one to go deal with things where there's going to be more reliance on the individual tank crews and their individual lethality more than anything else. And I think that's going to be a push because 
you do not in this day and age, especially since now we're really, really pushing towards the idea of using drone swarms and more of this awesome stuff to prevent large scale mass casualties. We have to go back to fighting as individuals in support of one another instead of just grouping together. I think that's going to be a big push. I, I know that sounds like all over the place that I said, but that's the best way that I can put it. So I apologize to everyone and whoever's listening to this video. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you for your time. I know you're busy, so... Yeah, don't worry about it. Thank you.